Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. McKinney King, Interim Vice Chancellor and Director for UMKC's Division of Diversity and Inclusion. On behalf of all of UMKC, I wanna welcome you to another installment of UMKC's Critical Conversations. Racism is embedded in the fabric of our society. The movement for black lives and continued tragic and needless murder of black and brown people have sparked a global movement that highlights this dysfunction that permeates every aspect of our existence. Regardless of race, every person is impacted by racism, though many have not engaged this topic head on. We have historically been discouraged from doing so, which is unfortunate because how can we work on changing something we can't even talk about? UMKC is committed to hosting these critical conversations, addressing systemic racism in the United States. The goal of each discussion is to enlighten, educate, and explore the causes and potential cures for racism. Today's discussion is the eighth installment in our series, centering the topic of black and brown excellence in the classroom, exploring bridges and barriers to success. At the conclusion of this conversation, we want you to take this information with you and integrate it into your commitment for racial justice in the future. And now I will turn this over to our moderators, our own Adriana Suarez, UMKC's sophomore honor student, who is working towards a Bachelor of Business Administration in Nonprofit Management, and a minor in Sociology and Latinx and Latin American Studies, and Gary O'Bannon, Executive in Residence at the Henry W. Block School of Management. Gary? Good afternoon, everyone, and hello. I am Gary O'Bannon, your co-moderator of today's event. On behalf of UMKC Chancellor Molly Agrawal, of course, Dr. King, Lona Davenport, Yvonne Hood, High View, our techno technological guru, students, faculty, and staff, and all others, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Thank you for giving us part of your day. You're going to enjoy today's conversation. But before we, we begin, and to complement Dr. King's opening remarks, I ask you to please take one additional moment to reflect again on the unfortunate death of George Floyd 11 months ago, and for so many others who have died at the hands of those sworn to protect our communities. As Dr. King alluded, Mr. Floyd's murder last May 25th is what gave birth to UMKC's Critical Conversation Series, and I've been honored to co-moderate these events knowing that three of these sessions have addressed the topic of police reform. I want to be clear, I don't want to indict the majority of police officers who serve ethically with professionalism, respect, and empathy, but UMKC wants to do its part in keeping a spotlight on the requirement of our nation to implement real across the board police reforms to protect us from those who want to injure as opposed to safeguard our communities. And of course, that includes needed reforms within our own Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, which many of you know is actually controlled by the state of Missouri and not our local government. So no, Mayor Quentin Lucas cannot dictate to police how to engage in the communities that he was voted to serve. We're the last major city to have such an outdated governance structure. For the longest time, Kansas City and St. Louis were the only major cities without local control but St. Louis took back control in 2013. There was progress this week and even today. The KCMO PD announced three major policy changes. Officers are now required to intervene if they see another member using excessive force. Two, police shootings are now investigated by state troopers and not the local police. And three, announced just hours ago, all officers will now wear body cameras. So yes, we're pleased over these long overdue changes and we rejoice in the sliver of justice we experienced 48 hours ago with the conviction of George Floyd's murderer. However, we are not at all satisfied. Put simply, it is not enough. Also note that the three officers who stood by and watched George Floyd die remain free tonight. Let us continue to honor the lives lost at the hands of the police and keep their families in our collective thoughts. Unfortunately, those left behind will continue to carry the tragedies of these murders throughout their lives. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you for giving me that moment. 
All right, let's talk education. I'm going to make what I believe to be a safe assumption, which is that we have plenty of educators on this webinar. So it's no revelation to you that decades of research shows that one's identity and learning are intricately related. One's racial identity, grounded in a sense of one's own intelligence and integrity, results in greater engagement in school and ultimately better academic performance. Yet all too often, black and brown students face racist stereotypes, not only from other students, but also from teachers, as horrific as that is to hear when it lands on your ears. Study after study reveals that a student's real fear of fulfilling a stereotype often interferes with cognitive function and subsequently lowers performance, especially when the negative stereotype relates to intellectual competence. This can cause students to spend less time preparing for an assignment or result in that student denying a project's importance to avoid a sense of failure. The good news is that educators have the power to consciously and intentionally strengthen a student's identity. In addition, school systems can demand that teachers create environments that mirror the achievements of black and brown people. They can also easily feature inspiring role models, debunk myths, and allow, allow students to maintain their cultural identity as they excel in the classroom. These are just some of the issues we want to address in this critical conversation appropriately titled Black and Brown Excellence in the Classroom, Exploring Bridges and Barriers to Success. We'll discuss both. And we have an esteemed panel to do just that. Before we introduce them to you, I'd like to first welcome my co-moderator, UMKC student, Adriana Suarez, and ask her to brag on herself just a little bit because Adriana is a shining example of how bright our future is. And we need that light as we come out of a year long pandemic. Good afternoon, Ms. Suarez, good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you too, thanks so much. I'm so excited for this conversation tonight. Um, as a student at UMKC and growing up in um, a very diverse um, county, I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, um, and I graduated from Sumner Academy um, in 2019. Um, so I'm super excited to be here, and you know I have a lot of plans to contribute to diversity in our community. I really hope to um, in the future work at a nonprofit in community development, and um, I do plan on studying abroad in Ireland, South Korea, and bringing some of that different culture and that experiences um, back to UMKC and to the community here. Um, so I really hope that what we learn today and what others are educated about, they can take it and they can use it in their own way. All right, what did I tell you? Shining star, I just hope we can keep Adriana in Kansas City once she graduates, keep that local talent local. I will now ask the panelists to self-introduce themselves by giving an overview of their background and why this topic is important to them and to our nation. Dr. Lois Carruthers, please start us off and then followed by Edgar J. Palacios, Lauren Sanchez, and Dr. Brandon Martin. Dr. Carruthers. Ms. Carruthers, if you could unmute yourself. You warned us of that. <laughs> I'll start all over. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Lois Carruthers, professor of education, University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Education. I teach qualitative research courses and courses to prepare administrators to be leaders in urban schools. Wonderful. All right. Mr. Palacios. Hopefully, it will. oh, there you go. There <laughs> it is. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Edgar Palacios. I'm the founder of the Latinx Education Collaborative, um, and we work on increasing the representation of Latinx education professionals in K-12. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lauren Sanchez. Hi, my name is Laura Sanchez. I am a program director with Kaufman Scholars. We are a college scholarship program for first generation college students. Uh, why it's important for, for me to be here today is because I've worked with Kaufman Scholars for 13 years and uh, we're still trying to figure out how to best support our students to college completion. Uh, we know that scholarship dollars, you can't throw money at it. It's not the only answer. Um, so I'm here today to help share some of the things that I've learned uh, and continue to learn on the path to supporting our students of color. I'm a uh, Brooklyn, New York transplant, Kansas City native for 
over 20 years, and I'm excited to participate in this discussion today. All right, thank you, Laura. And uh, bring us home, Dr. Brandon Morton. Thank you, Gary. First, I'd like to thank uh, you, Gary and Adriana, and also Dr. King for this opportunity. Um, I'm uh, Brandon Martin. I'm the Vice Chancellor and Director of Athletics at UMKC. Um, I also serve as a executive in residence in the Block School of Management, um, as well as the School of Education. Uh, I have 21 years of experience in intercollegiate athletics, uh, working at uh, uh, University of Southern California for 10 years, three years at the University of Oklahoma, both as Senior Associate Athletics Director, um, also the Director of Athletics position for five years at uh, Cal State Northridge, and I've been in this capacity for two and a half years. The reason why this is important to me is because I think there's alarm at the gate for black and brown achievement. Um, this is uh, a time where we need to have a heavy discourse about elevation, about change, and about possible selves for this, for this population. And so um, I'm delighted to be here amongst my colleagues and peers and look forward to a robust conversation. All right, thank you, panel. We keep the format simple. I'll address questions to the panel for uh, about 30 minutes or so, and then I'll transition to Adriana, who will take us up to about 4.15, and we will then open up questions from the audience. So let's begin. The anniversary of the Supreme Court landmark case, Brown versus Board of Education, is less than one month away. On May 17, 1954, the court ruled that state laws establishing racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional, even if the segregated schools are otherwise equal in quality. But if you know about Kansas City's educational history, you know we had our own landmark case some 20 years after Brown. Dr. Carruthers, you are the person to tell us what efforts were put in place to desegregate schools here in Kansas City. And this has been a topic of mine for quite some time. I have written about this issue, uh, but the district avoided federal oversight for nearly 30 years after Brown. And this was done through attendance boundaries, lenient transfer policies of students, hyper segregated residential communities resulting from black block busting, redlining and white flight. Then we know there was the truce a uh, dividing line that separated black and white schools with most uh, students, students attending schools east of Truce and north of 27th Street. For a while, many blacks in Kansas City could not live past 27th Street. In 1971, the first effort to desegregate the schools was a plan called 6C, the School District's Voluntary Desegregation Plan. It involved the re re uh, redrawing of attendance boundaries and busing of black students to white schools. And of course, Plan C failed to achieve integrated schools. Then we had Jenkins versus Missouri starting in 1977, which spanned 18 years with follow-up appeals. The court ordered in 1985, the dismantling of practices and a remedial plan ordered by the court that included an inter-district transfer plan that would allow black kids to attend suburban schools and white children to transfer into um, district schools. The surrounding suburban districts were eventually not held liable for the interdistrict plan. So the court decided to improve Kansas City, Missouri School District through renovation and new construction and the creation of theme magnet schools to entice white families back to the district. And for a while, white children from surrounding districts were bused to Kansas City schools in cabs. Those cabs were paid by the district. Court order desegregation ended in 1995 with the district establishing unitary status in 2003. All right, so let me ask you, was it a success or a failure? It was essentially a failure. Uh, we were interested uh, in interviewing people in Kansas City, educators, students, community members, and parents who had experienced school desegregation, starting as early as 1971 with Plan 6C and moving upward to the uh, Jenkins case. Uh, we decided, because I was a part of the district then in terms of court order desegregation, 
I was at the district office as the program coordinator for the effective schools. Uh, I knew that their stories had not been told regarding those experiences because my story had not been told. So we devised a website that features video interviews, historical artifacts related to school desegregation, curriculum resources available for, for download, and what we call a community yearbook feature where individuals could upload photos and narratives around school desegregation. Now, most of those participants uh, contributed failure to white flight and the overall refusal of white parents to allow their children to sit beside black and brown children in classrooms. An example of this could be seen in uh, the exodus of white families and overall racism. For instance, for Sale High School in 1955, no black student enrollment. By 1965, the year I graduated from Purcell, there were 50% Black children attending Purcell. By 1975, the, that school was entirely Black, 99% Black. So uh, do you support the scholarly explanations for the failure? You know, I have been studying this for so long. I was once the uh, director of educational equity at the uh, McCrail Mid-Continent Regional Educational Laboratory, uh, uh, a uh, regional laboratory funded by the Department of Education. So this has been kind of a life career study of mine as early as uh, the late 80s. But when we listen to not only the voices of those participants that we interviewed, their voices had memories of color, transcripts of anti-Blackness that they could not forget. For instance, uh, we heard stories quite, uh, quite a bit about separate play playground periods during, uh, I guess it would have, been, would have been Plan 6C when Black kids were bused into surrounding white schools. The participants talked about that even though they were bused into those schools, they were still taught by Black teachers. They had separate playground periods. Uh, they told stories of sometimes been out on the playgrounds for long periods of times because it was way it was the way to get them out uh, out of the buildings. Uh, while many of these uh, participants captured those sentiments, they seem to have become normalized. Uh, and they found it difficult to name years of black suffering as sources of dangerous memories and, and pain. Uh, I've been reading about Derek Bell's uh, work. He describes a Brown decision that was in tune with the history of America where blacks were not entitled to the same rights as whites. Uh, Dumas, Dumas's work also uh, is pretty exciting and revealing. He talks about an overall disregard of black people in other words, a social recognition of the humanness of others systematically excludes this possibility for the Black. Uh, he gives an example of the theme magnet schools that were placed or created in many districts across the country to attract white families back to the district. And then he wondered why these theme magnet schools were never considered for Black children and youth. He points out that these attractive programs or a clear indication of deep-seated beliefs regarding anti-Blackness. Black youth just cannot succeed in rigorous programs. And so I've been reading a, quite a bit of literature around this particular area and writing uh, about this area as well. Uh, these are difficult conversations to have and they're very sensitive as well, especially when you think about this whole notion of anti-Blackness and what many of these scholars are calling uh, slavery being uh, uh, sources of the living dead, and that even in contemporary schools, in, in contemporary society, we uh, appear to be the walking dead. Mr. Palacios, interested in your perspective on Kansas City's history. You know, um, Dr. Carruthers, first and foremost, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's um, 
it's it's such a powerful history that needs to continue to be shared and, and lived. Um, the only commentary that I can add or context that I would add is, you know, this is the shared experience as well in the Latinx community. Um, when I when, when I hear Brown versus Board of Education, I'm also reminded of um, Mendez versus Westminster, which was a landmark case in 1946 um, that um, Sylvia Mendez, um, who was eight at the time, um, was integrating um, schools, right? And I think at that time in California, um, there were white schools and there were Mexican schools. And so this idea that, you know, th this is where our communities intersect and we have those similar challenges um, and that we have that same, our, our common enemy is white supremacy. Um, and so just that context and how we see it play out today in Kansas City Public Schools as well, not in just public schools, but in, in, in just in all districts in, in the community, um, it's incredible to see the legacy of, of this work. Absolutely, thank you for those comments. Um, at one time, the Kansas City, Missouri School District had over 30,000 students. And I just checked yesterday and it's just under 16,000. And I've never been able to determine whether or not it's a good thing that many students have opted for alternatives like charter schools, considering the district still has yet to regain their full accreditation. Or is there a negative to such a drop? And I'll go back to you, Dr. Carruthers. Well, I have also studied that issue as well. In one of the papers that I have recently submitted for publication, I talk about the growth of charter schools in Kansas City. Matter of fact, uh, some of the literature talks about Kansas City being the top five, among the top five districts in the nations to have charter schools. As of 2019, there are 20 charter schools in Kansas City. Um, interestingly, those schools, in many cases, the achievement is no different than it is in the Kansas City, Missouri School District. So there's some things that are systemically wrong in terms of how we are addressing these issues and the education of black children. Uh, they are pretty widely segregated with uh, Latinx and black youth as well. All right, let's move on to our next topic. Ms. Sanchez, I have one for you. I've only touched on it briefly in my open, but what assumptions are made about black and brown students that are actually biases entrenched in white dominant culture? Uh, I mean, there are several. Um, you know, bias is a, is a part of human nature. I think our struggle and our challenge is to recognize that it exists, that there's no, none of us that operate without bias that come into play. You know, anytime we witness a behavior that is unexpected, our bias fills in the blanks as to the, the character traits of that person and why that's happening. Uh, so when we look at brown, black and brown students in classrooms, um, especially when we look at the post-secondary space, there are assumptions about time. You know, how many times have many of you heard, I know I've heard, if you're uh, not early, you're late. Uh, and if you are late, then you're lazy or you don't respect uh, anyone else's time. If, you're, if you have problems meeting deadlines for a class or getting a paper done, then you lack motivation. Uh, you know, or if your writing skills aren't on par for that college level class that you don't have anything intelligent to say. These assumptions mean that every, uh, uh, just take into take for granted that everyone's coming from the same level of experiences. Uh, COVID nineteen has really kind of amplified the differences with this. Where even in our program, we have more students that are working full time in addition to going to school full time to support their parents. So when they're late to class, it's not because they don't care; it's because they're either uh, coming off of work or dropping, you know supporting other students at home, making breakfast. So there's some additional parental obligations that they're taking on uh, in addition to just being a student. Uh, many black and brown students don't have the privilege to be able to just go to school full time and just choose to maybe take a work study job. Uh, there are many that, and many of our students that work part time, not just to put money in their pocket, but to, to, to support their families as well. So when the, these same students have struggles with staying awake in class uh, or meeting deadlines or arriving on time, um, you know, we have to be mindful to not fill in the blanks of when we observe this behavior on the surface uh, to make those assumptions about their character and um, and assume that they're not trying to succeed just like any other student in the classroom. Um, where do you 
land the main responsibility for uh, for how that uh, classroom environment gets changed? Is it on the individual teacher solely, or is it also on the districts or on the systems? What needs to change uh, where that particular environment uh, is viewed as completely inappropriate and unacceptable? Mm -hmm. I think it, change has to happen at every level. It has to happen at the larger systemic level, the macro level, when you look at the district level, um, even with individual schools. And then when it comes down to, but ultimately uh, what it comes down to is that individual classroom and that instructor. Um, you know, when I think about even my college experience, the instructors that had said simple things to me that, that have changed my trajectory. So it's when you have the people that are actually interacting with our students of color, uh, they're the ones that have the largest impact in that moment of either, um, they're either helping to eliminate barriers and open up access to opportunity or unintentionally creating barriers based on the bias that they bring with them in the room. What about the influence uh, that the systems put on grades and uh, teacher performance evaluations? Do you think that's part of the problem? I think it's part of the problem, but it's not, it's not the only problem. Sure. You, know, you have to, you have to have, you have to have approaches at every level. Uh, but at the same time, you can't say, oh, well, this is too big for me. I can't have, it's not really about me and the work I do with students. It's because of the system or because of what is, because of, you know, um, what's required of me. When you look, when you look at uh, in the post-secondary space, how that translates to is thinking about your, uh, let's say your curriculum, whether you're a professor or you're a uh, teaching assistant. And if you're seeing that a student is falling asleep in class or you're starting to notice behavior uh, that is indicative of a student not being, not being on track academically, then you begin to, that's when you need to talk to each student individually and then figure out how you support that student so that you can help them succeed. Uh, just as well as as, the, as all of the other students in the classroom. All right, so Dr. It's, Martin, it's both. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, scholars agree on the impact that implicit bias plays in the classroom and how it translates into real implications for educational achievement. So as a black man that came up through the system and you've succeeded, what were your experiences and what are the factors that necessitate an enhanced teaching and learning experience for boys and young men of color? Sure, Gary, I think it's a great question. And, and I'll start with the first question in terms of my experiences. And so I'm, I'm not from Kansas City, but um, I was raised in South Central Los Angeles. And so, um, and this was around the Rodney King uh, riots back in 1992. And so when you, when you think about what that environment represented, it was deplorable. And it was gang infested, it was drug filled, it was um, survival. And so um, going to school, Gary, uh, when you have metal detectors before you go into a school is problematic. That impacts the psyche of any type of student um, in high school. And so that's what I experienced. Um, so, you know, for me, um, I am, to your point, Gary, I am person who um, has gone through the system. And the system is, uh, for the most part, not designed for black and brown to be successful. I just want to make that point. Okay. And so when we talk about um, all of these, the, these factors, one of the main issues that we have is that we, we, we don't have educators that are prepared to work with black and brown students. Okay. That, so that's, that's point one. So when you talk about these unique experiences, it's all about factors like home life, it's factors like uh, racial and gender stereotypes, it's gender roles, how are um, black boys socialized? All of those things are important. Um, some of the key factors that I think are key, Gary, is one, the external life pressures. And, 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 and one of those is um, that a lot of kids go to school hungry. Uh, they're not eating healthy. Uh, that's important. Uh, transportation. A lot of kids uh, uh, can't, they have to, it's a challenge for them to even get to school. And I, I think that's, that's an important factor to, to highlight 
The other one is technology. Uh, there's a lack of technology um, in the home. And we've taken some tremendous strides with that, um, but there's still a, a gap there that we need to, um, to, uh, to, to really figure out. And also trauma, uh, there's trauma. So there's a lot of verbal trauma. There's a lot of physical trauma that I don't think uh, is, is factored into the um, educational achievement uh, conversation. The other piece that I think is when you talk about racial and gender stereotypes, <clears throat> there's this sense of um, criminalized viewpoints as you talk about black and brown boys, right? And so when you talk about that, it's uh, deviants, it's criminals, it's delinquents, it's drug dealers, it's being a womanizer, it's um, being a murderer, right? And so we have to get away from these type of stereotypes and our educators have to be in line with that. One that is, is most common is, is that both black and brown boys are academically inferior. Um, and I think that's critically important. Um, there's a lot of a body of research that talks about how uh, Latino young boys um, are, 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 have a lack of motivation. They're not interested uh, in, in achieving academically, particularly those who um, where English is a second language. There's a body of, of, of research that talks about that. And so when you link that and parallel that to the microaggressions, you got to consider the impact that it has on the students. And what are those? That's anxiety, that's stress, and anger, okay? So <laughs> that really impacts both um, Black and, and the Latino population. And when we think about how um, young boys are socialized, um, you know, Black and Brown boys are socialized to be tough. You know, they're, they're socialized to be aggressive um, and they're celebrated for that, which dovetails into if you are a stellar athlete, you are celebrated. And um, if you are a stellar person in science or math, you're not as celebrated as a person who is the all city uh, basketball player or football player. And that's, and that's problematic. Um, the last point that I'll say, um, and I'm not gonna delve too deep into it, is there's some consideration that we have to give to um, the brain and, and hormonal development um, of both boys, the differences between young boys and young, young girls. And, you know, that gets into more of some of the uh, tactile learning that gets into the competition and aggression that gets into the overstimulation things that we could talk about. Um, and so I think those four things are things that educators um, and educational practitioners need to strongly consider as we move forward in this process. And what I heard you describe is in effect the system that people have had to come up into, but uh, let me ask Ms. Sanchez, uh, what is your take on what the system description sounds like to you? When I think about system, I think about um, really all the levels of influence that have power and control. Uh, so you start from the furthest removed. Let's say if we talk about education, you would talk about education at the federal level, then potentially regional, then state, then local, and even within a specific school, there's a system within that school. But typically those systems end up having an impact on students of color where they have little, uh, little to no opportunity to be able to have a voice in or power within them. So when I think about system, that's that's what comes to mind for me. What does it mean to you also, uh, Dr. Carruthers? Same thing? You know, um, in terms of what Ms. Sanchez just had to mention in terms of these levels, uh, I um, agree with the uh, conception of systems. But what's interesting to me is how the language of the system begins to impact all of us, even at the local level. Many of the students that I work with at the doctor level is quite interesting. 
when they hear the language subgroup in No Child Left Behind. To me, it was a, it's a denigrating uh, term. Minority is a denigrating term, but they see all of this language in policy documents and then they use this same language to describe students of color in schools, uh, students who speak another language. Uh, we use the language of at risk that has come to mean uh, black and brown children and poor children and all of that language just simply, I call it, it demonizes uh, kids. And so when they see this language in policy documents at the federal, state, local, and even district levels, for them that, that language is okay to use in their interactions with kids. What's better language? What's better language? Yes. For instance, I encourage uh, students to talk about minoritized groups because we have minoritized children in terms of our actions and interactions with them. Children of color, historically underserved children, uh, brown and black children, children of color. There's many other ways to describe the identities of children of color without demonizing them with such language as minority, subgroup, at risk, et cetera. It's the, the images that language brings to mind. And we have a difficult time getting rid of it. I mean, I have bright um, uh, students of all colors and I spent a lot of time going through their dissertations, getting rid of deficit language because those dissertations are out there for the whole world to see. Yeah. And I don't wanna put my name on those. And so I have to many times go back and say, get rid of the deficit thinking. Your dissertation is going to be out there for others to read and you don't want to communicate those images of black and brown children. Yeah, those are those are just such great comments. Thank you for that. Mr. Palacios, anything to add? Yeah, no, and you know, uh, Dr. Carruthers, again, I appreciate that work and I appreciate um, what it's making me think about, which is this work is personal. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about biases and when we're talking about versus systems and whatnot, we, we can understand and 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 know that the system itself is is rooted in white supremacist culture. Um, if, if you're not familiar with like tenants or, or um, ideas of what rent supremacist culture, there's a, a great um, article by uh, Tema Okun, a scholar in this work that lists out different ways about thinking about how you how we operate in white supremacist culture. But I think important to this conversation is that we have to do with the internal work of understanding what our biases are, what we're bringing into classrooms, into situations, into social settings, and to then do the work of remove of, of remove of, of those ideas, not necessarily room, but to be aware of them and to and to act differently because of, of that we know better. Um, and so, even in in that you know deficit mindset, deficit language conversation, like that's ingrained mm -hmm. into Absolutely. us. And so, this is lifelong work. You know, I, there are times where I will make comments, or I will think things, mm -hmm. or I will lean into my biases, and then. Luckily, I have a community of folks that will hold me in, in space and say, this is, this is why this thinking, you should think differently about this. So this is why you should think in, in a different manner about these things. And so, you know, it's sometimes the system can be overwhelming and to think about how do we change the system um, can often lead us into a place of paralysis um, and, and not moving or not taking action. For me, it's really about how do we show up as, as an individual um, and what are we doing to, to combat these ideas and to, and, to, and to demonstrate that we can do better and we do know better. Dr. Martin and then Dr. Sanchez, uh, why does student support seem to take on this one size fits all solution when clearly that's not been effective? Dr. Martin first. Yeah, I, I just wanna make a few comments first and then I'll answer that question, Gary. You know, I, I think based on uh, especially the work that Dr. Carruthers has done um, and some of the points, that she, salient points that she's made throughout this discussion, I think we need to make some, some uh, clear understandings about our educational system. Our educational system um, has been designed to manipulate 
uh, uh, black and brown. When you talk about boys um, who are black and brown, there's been a, a tip to um, emasculate uh, black and brown boys in terms of their ability to believe that they can be much more than just a student um, and much more than um, uh, that, that they can achieve. And so um, based on that, when you think about the number of students that have been mislabeled in the educational system and when a black and brown student is mislabeled in the educational system, that is the first um, indication and the first sign that they will end up um, in the penitentiary, okay? So I wanted to make sure that that is, is, is understood. When we talk about this one size fits all approach, I think we have to understand that <laughs> there's gifted students as well, right? So if we have a one-size approach, right, then there's gifted students who are not getting the needs that they need in the system, okay? So this is not just about the students who um, maybe are on the margins or, or, or low achieving. We have to have um, sort of a, a combined approach um, in our system. And I'm gonna talk about this later and how we, it's important that we understand the student that we're serving. And it's important that we build relationships, not just with the student, but with the families and with the community. You know, the, the, the message about it takes a village. Well, you know, this is multifactorial. You know, we, we, need, we need everybody to pitch in to make sure that our black and brown um, young boys and, and students are being successful. So if we have a one size fits all approach, that means that um, our high achieving students are gonna, not going to get what they need. And perhaps the students who are on the margins are not going to get what they need. And so we need more of a tailorized approach um, towards student achievement, in my opinion. Ms. Sanchez, any follow up? Did, did, did Dr. Martin leave anything left for you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yes, I agree with, completely with what uh, Dr. Martin is saying, but, and I would also add, uh, for me, it, it speaks to the difference between equality and equity. It, you know, when you're striving for equality, it's everyone getting the same resources. Uh, but when you really look at equity, not as Dr. Martin was saying, Everyone has different life experiences. They don't need the same things. Um, with your example, with students that are gifted versus students that may be a little bit further behind, they don't need the same resources. So resources need to be customized uh, to what they what will help each of them be successful. Uh, as for an example, within our program uh, with COVID-19, a lot of our students weren't able to live on campus. Uh, and our scholarship typically covers housing and dining. So now students had to had an additional cost for dining and we had to think quickly about how we serve those students. Uh, one option we had was utilizing like a Grubhub and providing a set amount of Grubhub dollars per student. Well, that would be more of, um, more of an equality kind of approach. Our students are across the country. Uh, so if you just look at cost of living, we have a couple of scholars in New York City that are spending way more in Grubhub dollars than our students in Kansas City. Uh, so in that space, we need, to, we need to also look and say, okay, with this intervention, how are we making sure that we're providing uh, an equitable level of support for our students across the country? Um, so when we talk about this one size fits all, our lives aren't one size fits all. So that, that why should our interventions be? Thank you for that. All right, Dr. Carruthers, gonna put you on the spot right now. We've got a great question from the audience and uh, audience, thank you for your uh, engagement. The question reads, I have worked on archival research with young Latinas writing. What language should I use as I work on my research to discuss their writing, to reform my language and writing to not be a place of deficit? 
I think you're on mute. Okay. You yeah, I think that you have to use the language of your participants. You want to be authentic. And so you want to make sure that, you know, for instance, when I look at quotes, you know, I often get from my students, well, should I change those quotes? Because some, sometimes the language is not as they view as the standard dialect, because all language is a dialect. There's no pure language. And so in order to be authentic, you have to use the language of your students. It might be a mixture of uh, Hispanic languages or Hispanic dialects and English, but whatever that language might be, if you're going to be authentic, you have to use that language. Very good. And I, I just wanted to add something to what Dr. Martin was saying also about uh, uh, black boys and this whole notion that uh, uh, Ms. Sanchez, Ms. Dr. Sanchez was talking in regard to uh, uh, young girls and uh, Latina girls. Uh, you know, there, there's not a one size fit all because even when we look at the literature around um, black and brown girls in schools that they, they uh, face specific uh, challenges. Um, you know, there's been these images and stereotypes from slavery that black women still encounter. Mammy, the angry black woman, the loud black woman, et cetera. And so many of those stereotypes are still live in a well in society through media images and et cetera. And so they're played out in schools around Latina girls and black girls. And so those are the things that we have to look at as well as we begin to look at what, what's happening to black and brown children in schools. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers. Dr. Martin, the local African-American community was ecstatic to see your elevation to vice chancellor. And I want to acknowledge that I was one of those people. However, the truth is that there's still not enough black and brown leadership across the academic community. And consequently, one of the big ask of black and brown students and parents is to see more teachers who look like them. And obviously this is for many reasons, but one of the most important is the opportunity to build relationships with those who know your journey. What are your thoughts on the importance of relationships as a critical foundation for teaching and learning? And again, particularly for boys and young men of color. Yeah. You know, I, I want to start this by saying that if, if we're talking about this from an urban uh, perspective, you know, we, you have so many teachers um, who have uh, devoted so much time and energy into um, black and brown students, and they're tired. They, they it's, they're, they're, they're tired. Um, and of course, you know, this is uh, the technology and, you know, some of the the um, efforts have, you know, really advanced since the time that, you know, I was in high school. But, you know, I, I, I think when you talk about relationships, um, relationships is the critical cornerstone uh, for enhancing um, the learning experiences for boys of color. And this applies to teachers, it applies to uh, educational professionals. Um, and when you talk about building relationships, there are some relational dynamics that you have to consider. One is trust, the other one is mutual respect, and then the other one is authentic care. And so those three things are, are critical. And to delve a little deeper, uh, the other piece is, is that um, there has to be some rapport and trust. Um, there has to be some commitment to leveraging um, the assets. Um, that the students are bringing to the learning environment. There also has to be a recognition to some of the external barriers um, that students bring to the table. And so I, I, I'm an advocate to say that we, we have to recognize what families want. Um, there's, a huge body, there's a huge body of research that, that, that talks about families. And I think the misunderstanding is, is that regardless of if families are coming from a first generation standpoint, that they're not sending college going messages to the students. That's not true. Um, and so we need to dispel and debunk that myth um, up front. Um, and so the other one is, is that we have to engage parents. We have to engage parents in, in that process 
And we have to teach the parents how they need to be engaged in that process with their students. And that's not a one size fits all approach. Because the way one parent engage, engages one student, given their, um, I guess, um, aptitude and their um, learning experiences is totally different. And so we need to find a way to engage the, the, the parents in a learning process. Um, I also think we need to try and highlight and demonstrate um, high expectations for all the students. I think we need to do that. I think that's critically important. If we have low expectations, what does that represent? Well, that represents from the educator that um, you know you don't care um, and you don't really care about my, my experience as a learner. Um, I think there has to be some understanding of appropriate disclosing. And what I mean by that is, is that as a, as a instructor, a teacher who may have had some similar experiences of the, of that student, you know, they need to say, Hey, I understand where you're coming from. They need to send those messages. I understand your struggle. I understand your journey. I think that's critically important moving forward. Validation is critically important. Um, saying you can do it, you can achieve. All of those things for black and brown students is, is important because they don't hear that on a consistent basis. Um, I think resilience, the, the part about being uh, the, the toughness and, and, and having the fortitude to be successful, those are the things that uh, some of us on this call today um, had to have to be where we are today on this call. And I think we have to be able to convey that to the students. Um, the part of control, um, all of our students have the control um, to do whatever they, they want to do and, and to be able to take their educational and academic experiences as high as they want to take it. And so we need to be able to send those messages to those students. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, is that we have to paint uh, positive futures for our students. We have to um, tell them, you will go to college one day. Um, you will be a CEO one day. You will be a college professor one day. Um, you will um, you know, be a college president or even better yet, you will be an athletic director one day. But we have to take that we have to take that and we have to we have to really take it and really teach them how they can get to that point. It's not enough to say you can do those things, right? Because they're young and they can't conceptualize how they can get to that point. So what we have to do is we have to draw out that tailorized plan that we talked about earlier and we have to teach them how they can get to that point. I think that's critically important. Thank you for those comments. Ms. Uh, Sanchez, comments on uh, criticality of relationships. If you don't build trust with your students, you're not, they're not gonna come to you for support. You're, they're not um, really going to, if the only time that you talk to them is when something is wrong, it's not gonna build a relationship or a strategy of success for them. Um, so having that relationship building that relationship and building that trust up front is important. Because then even if you make mistakes along the way and your bias may, leads to an assumption with something that's happened, uh, that student is more likely to be able to forgive and work with you past that. Uh, but without that trust, you shut down that relationship. How many, uh, there's so many students we've worked with when we talk to them about, have you talk, gone to your professor for their office hours? Well, no, he, you know, she doesn't care about me. Or you know, there, there's a they filled in the blanks about their professors as well when there's when the relationship has been lacking. Um, so it's so important when, especially as as an educator in that space, you're the one in that position in a position of power to be able to set that tone of how uh, a relationship is important. If that relationship is important and comes before you know, like then the education follows. Uh, 
and just being able to, you know, assume that your students want to succeed. And in the conversations, not focusing on what's wrong, your students know that they're, you know, students that are struggling know that they're struggling. Uh, really talking about what can I do to help you succeed, assuming that every, you assume that every student wants to succeed and that you have the ability to help that student get there instead of coming from a deficit space. Uh, goes a long way in those communications with students. Um, and many times when um, you ask students to participate and share in setting what those expectations should be, they're going to set higher expectations for themselves than you, than you do. So it's all about giving them that opportunity and really showing in that relationship and that trust that you build with them that you see the potential that they have. And I may be wrong, but I think Dr. Carruthers is about ready to jump out of her seat. So uh, do you want to continue <laughs> to this conversation as well? <laughs> and you'll, you'll have to unmute yourself. You know, that's okay. I said, I have a great expectation story. As, as Sanchez and Mark were talking, I just was recalling some experiences. And I am a project kid, a poor project kid, been raised in Therambi Watkins housing projects. And as I said before you today, no one would ever think that I would be where I am today. And it was high expectations on a part of a white, red head English teacher that made a difference for me at ninth grade at Purcell High School, where my expectations and self-esteem was so low for myself, because at that time, Black kids would say, well, we got C for color because we never received any uh, feedback on our work. And so those red marks never told us how to improve our work. And so one day, Mr. Gershwin took an essay and I had such low self-esteem. I wrote small because I didn't think anyone was gonna read it anyway. And I could have written out of the dictionary, it didn't make any difference, never got any feedback. He brought that essay over to me and he said, I'm not gonna read this. I want you to do this over again, and this time write larger. Well, I had wrote small for so long, it took twice as long to rewrite that essay. I took it back to him, uh, got pretty quick feedback, and I believe in that today with my uh, graduate students, feedback is important. And then he simply walked over to me, touched me on the shoulder and said, good job, I knew you could do it. I start working for him for that praise. Somebody finally read my work and knew that I could do it. And then I start working for myself and that made a difference in my life. The other point that uh, Sanchez makes about gifted students, those sometimes students that we ignored, uh, I was not trained any less than white teachers or any more than white teachers would be trained to work in inner city schools. And so I did, I brought that those skills into my urban classroom, not knowing how to teach those children. So I think that all teachers have to be prepared to teach all kids. And it was a gifted black girl that taught me how to interact with those kids. She was so gifted. Years later, cause she's still a friend of mine. She's, 12 years younger than I am. She's 60 and I'm 73. <laughs> and she, I asked her, I said, what do you wish that I had done for you back in seventh grade? This was 1972. She said, I wish you would have pushed me harder. Because what I did is I allowed her to take care of me instead of taking care of herself. And so I had to apologize to her and then realize how many other kids that I had I hurt because I ignored those kids that were doing more and I did not uh, differentiate in terms of their work. And so I just have to comment on that because I was, it brought back so many memories, both of those conversations from uh, doctors uh, Sanchez and Martin. Well, and let me just say this, you know, you ain't no 73 years old. Right? Oh, yes, I am. I'm 73. No way. No way. I, yes, I, I am. I'm, and I'm proud to be 73. I'm not buying it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not buying it. For that. Okay. And hey, everybody's talking about where they're from. So let me throw mine in. I'm from 27th and Garfield. So as, as Steve Harvey used to say, don't let the suit and tie fool you, right? Okay. And so, I mean, we've all done very, very well. So let me, uh, let me switch it over now to Mr. Palacios, because I know he's got some comments as well. No, I appreciate that. And, you know, I know some folks um, in, in that part of the neighborhood that also just wear suits and ties for fun. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's a, a reminder, you know, that um, we have to we have to decenter whiteness from these conversations, right? Like, I think about excellence. I think about um, who we are as people. And sometimes we measure against what we're taught in, in terms of the, the, the white communities, right? Um, and so... I'm just thinking about that comment in, in that sense. Like, we can also look good. Like, we can also dress well. Like, these are things that are not exclusive to any community. These are things that are who can be a part of who we are, period. Um, but, you know, I, I think about in, in terms of building relationships, first of all, they're critical in just community building, first and foremost, right? I think a lot of us overcome these systems and overcome. Um, navigate because we have strong communities. We have people who have invested in us and, and believe in us um, in these spaces, right? Who encourage us to continue and persist, um, sometimes in spite of what others are telling us. And so relationships are critical to this. Um, I'm also reminded of the fact that, you know, I advocate for more Latinx teachers, right? And some people say, well, does that mean that, you know, white teachers can't teach Latinx students? And I'm like, that's not what I'm saying at all, you know? I actually navigated an entire school system full of nothing but white teachers. I don't think I, I, I may have had one or two um, black teachers along the way, definitely not any Latinx teachers. Um, and so this idea that like, why is it that our community is underrepresented in these spaces, right? And I have a good friend who also reminds me of like, we always talk about the underrepresentation of teachers of color in these spaces. We never flip that. We never talk about why is it that white teachers are overrepresented in these spaces? Like, what is the connotation there? What's the questioning there? What are we learning from that question in itself, right? Um, so just, just the thought of, you know, I, I advocate for more Latinx teachers because it's that, that lived experience is also critical to understanding students. Sure. Um, I am a son of immigrants. Spanish was my first language. You know, I was terrible at sports. Um, these are things that like, make me who I am today. I actually just didn't practice enough sports, but that's a different conversation altogether. Um, and so it's important that we also have access, that every student has access to a diverse uh, body of professionals, right? Professional educators, because the reality is the world is diverse. You know, I think about the world outside of the United States, you know, particularly from a Latin American context, like there's Latin American excellence in South America and Central America, you know, in the Caribbean, there's like the world is bigger than just our local context. And, you know, sometimes we have to remember that like excellence is excellence, period. Uh, I really appreciate everyone sharing their personal story there and that question. And I think it leads um, great into the next question um, for Dr. Martin. Um, it appears most evidence shows a positive link between participation in sports and physical activity and higher levels of attentiveness in classrooms, ability to absorb and recall content and even on exams. So um, where do you come down on the impact of sports and the academic development and achievement of boys and young men of color, particularly, particularly at the K through 16 levels? Yeah, thank you, uh, Adriana. I think we could do a full critical conversation just on that alone. Uh, but but one of the things that, that that I will say is is that if you think about the black community, sports has been a, a, a precious commodity um, in terms of the ability for um, economic success, social mobility, um, and access to some of the trappings of success. Not so much the access to the real information that uh, black and brown um, athletes need to be able to navigate the world, okay? And so um, that, that's a whole nother deal. But when you talk about um, the impact of um, sports on academic achievement, I think is multifactorial. I think you have to consider number one, 
you have to consider the, the, the instructors, you have to consider the coaches. And I want to pause and put a pin in that because when you talk about um, the uh, college basketball, uh, college basketball um, has really put a black eye on um, college sports, but also higher education in terms of the, the amount of corruption that has happened. And um, that's another issue. Parents, agents, um, shoe companies, um, when you talk about community influencers, now we've, we've built this incorrigible monster in college athletics to where we have to go back to the days when John Thompson, uh, God bless his soul, really said, hey, you're going to come to Georgetown, you're going to get a degree. And there, there was some value in that. Now we've built this system with this new trend of name, image, and likeness to where student athletes um, are sort of uh, entrepreneurs and business owners, and they want to profit off of their name. And, and so that, that causes another issue because when you talk about it from a K through 12 standpoint, there's no one educating these students about how they need to maximize their educational experience. Unfortunately, what I'm saying is, is that the education has been put on the back burner. At UMKC, we have a great opportunity because most of our student athletes are gonna move on and they're gonna be executives, they're gonna be professionals, they're gonna be teachers, they're gonna be all of that. But when you look at it um, on a massive schedule across division one schools, um, it, it is a different mindset. And so um, one of the things that, that, that I would argue, we have a, a many um, students who wanna be the next LeBron James, they wanna be the next Russell Wilson, they want to be the next, um, you know, Ronald Acuna, and they want to make the big money. But, you know, one of the things that I think we have to do is, is that we have to try and find a way to elevate education, which means that we have to find a way to um, get closer to our teachers, get closer to our superintendents, get closer to our, our administrators at the K through 12 level before they get to college and the universities and get them to understand what the value of education is. And that's one of the problems. Now we have, we have young boys who don't really appreciate the value of education. They appreciate the things that are tangible. And the things that are tangible is the fact that I can go to this university for one year and I can buy my mother a house, I can get a nice car, I can save some money, I can do all of these things. But what happens five, seven, 10 years later? Okay, now all of a sudden we're doing, what are we doing? We're doing reparenting, right? We're doing reteaching. Okay, and now we have a huge influx of black and brown uh, students who actually need to go back through the system. And that's not what we want in this case. And so this is a situation where we want to guard against exploitation. We want to guard against exploitation at the highest level. I want to give a caveat. At UMKC, we don't have that issue. But if we're talking about this across the board at Division I schools, we have a major issue right now. And so that's one of the things we need to fix. Thank you for that response. Um, the next question is going to Ms. Carruthers. Um, what is entailed with Black Mattering in education and how should teachers be prepared for Black Mattering in the school environment? And don't, don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> I keep <laughs> muting myself and then forgetting to unmute. Uh, that's a really important uh, question. 
uh, black mattering in education has taken on a more critical significance because of the Black Lives Matter social media campaign that has raised the ongoing marginalization of black people. Uh, preparation for black mattering includes uh, many of the things that uh, Dr. Martin and Dr. Sanchez has uh, have talked about. Uh, we have to help pre-service teachers become familiar with the communities in which they teach. And so their experiences should be immersion in those communities. Learning the history of Kansas City and the systemic racism that has created a deeply segregated and marginalized community. They need to have early field experiences in urban schools, co-curricular and curricular programming that focuses on self, implicit bias, and how one's personal beliefs may in, uh, impact or influence interactions with others. Those conversations around reflections on who I am as a person are quite significant uh, because they take on different types of, um, oh, I would say um, images if one does not understand self as they interact with others. Uh, culturally relevant anti-racist and social justice pedagogy uh, with attention to marginalized youth. And one of the most important pieces is that we have to stop doing so much of what we call school stuff and think about building authentic relationships with students and families and helping families and communities understand and even communicate to us what they want for their children. Uh, I have to also applaud uh, the School of Education for this in terms of the Institute for Urban Education. Uh, that started at uh, UMKC in 2005 because a lot of the focus has been on preparing teachers for black mattering in schools as well as working with other uh, students of color. And uh, I recently interviewed uh, several teachers in this area just to learn about how their uh, preparation has helped them to address issues of black mattering as well as their work with other students of color and black and brown children. And one of the things that uh, I recall from those, that conversation was uh, one teacher saying, and this was a white teacher, she said, you know, I wanna have to, I wanna be able to say good morning to black boys before I ask them to tuck in their shirts. And uh, another comment that sort of stayed with me that these teachers basically uh, communicated that even though that they felt that they had been prepared well to go into urban schools, that sometimes they went into schools where cultures were uh, full of white supremacy, that there were a lot of kind of a traditional methods and they had a hard time holding on to those things that they had been taught. And sometimes they had to isolate themselves from others in order to hold on to those beliefs and the things that they felt that were, were right for working for children of color. And so those are just some of the areas that we have to prepare teachers for in terms of working with students of color and black and brown children. And all children, I would say, in terms of that area. High poverty children, regardless of their colors, their race or, or uh, ethnicity. Students who speak another language, immigrant children, Thank I you. A, I, I, I have a question. Uh, when I was researching the Kansas City, Missouri School District last night, I did not know, and I was just shocked, that 100% of the students that are in that district are eligible for uh, free meals. Right. I, mean, I thought that was an outstanding figure. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Carruthers, what, what competency do you think the education system needs to be looking for? Because they have had to have changed to match today's times. I mean, the same skill sets that you had 30 years ago, they're, they're not gonna work today. Well, you know, we just have to be really, really frank about it. You know, when you're sitting in a classroom mm -hmm. and all of the kids come from poverty and there's not uh, very many middle income kids regardless of their color or high income kids, 
then you're talking about the experiences that the, those children bring. And what we know is high poverty children, regardless of where of their race or ethnicity, sometimes don't do not have as rich of experiences. Now, that's not always going to be the case because when you talk about poverty, you're, you'll hear people saying we were poor, but we didn't know we were poor because so much was done to make up for things that we didn't have for the family. So you again, you know, as someone mentioned, you can't take one case and apply it to all in terms of even issues of poverty. But we know that issues of poverty present barriers for learning. And so until we integrate the larger society, uh, I think that we're gonna always be com uh, confronted with these issues. Um, and so it's a systemic issue. Poverty is a systemic issue as racism is a systemic issue. So we have to find ways to really support children economically within communities. Uh, neighborhoods, et cetera. Yeah, doing something on poverty is probably going to be in, uh, one of maybe the critical conversations we ought to think about looking at in the future. Right, yeah. exactly. If, if I can just jump in on this, um, you know, when we account for other variables still, and I, I don't want people to leave this conversation with saying like, well, this is no longer an issue about race and racism. This is an mm -hmm. issue about poverty, right? Or economic status or whatnot. Mm -hmm. When we when we still look at the data and account for all the variables, we do know that race is that critical variable mm. that comes to these issues, right? Like the, the, that, that is the thing. And so I don't want people to dismiss this concept around like, well, you know, poverty or second language is, or, you know, these are, there are other, they absolutely add context to the issue. Absolutely. But we're still dealing with matters of race. Um, and that, that's, that's the conversation that, you know, needs to happen in classrooms, in, um, in teacher prep programs and across the country, not just in urban districts or suburban districts, because the reality is like, we're operating in this system of white supremacy mm -hmm. and the data is the data. And you're absolutely right. It's that intersectionality of race, class, gender, and all of these isms, so to speak. You know, people latched on to Ruby Payne's work around poverty, and those conversations around race were forget forgotten. And so, uh, I believe that racism colors poverty. And so, I agree with you, uh, Edgar, wholeheartedly in terms of that area because we will latch onto a topic. And then we will uh, forget about those larger systemic issues around racism uh, that really affects poverty and economic conditions of people across the nation. Ms. Sanchez, did you have something to weigh in on? Uh, yes, there's actually a, a question that had come up about um, relationships being key and uh, kind of what we, what do we, what do you do, you know, uh, as if you're working with a, a teacher that uh, feels there's, I, I was torn between answering this question in the chat and finding a way to answer it in this space. So I appreciate that handoff. Um, so for those that can't see the question, uh, questions about um, what to do about a teacher who feels that he or she is superior to students. Um, our teachers tend to reflect the makeup of the society at large and many times, that includes white supremacy attitudes. Um, and then there's, we must recruit teachers who feel that each student is a human being who can perhaps even surpass the teacher. This is difficult to discuss, but is necessary. Yes, I 100% agree uh, with that speak with this. That, yes, I agree with, with this statement. Uh, my recommendation is when you are in a position of power, the first thing you need to do have to do is be willing to give up that power. Um, the, if you are working with a student and you're trying to address a concern, just start by assuming that you're wrong. You're not gonna know the answer. Your student is the expert of their experience. They know what's going on. We don't. Uh, so if you, you know, our bias tends to make us fill in that blank, don't fill in that blank, assume that whatever you're thinking is wrong, and it is your job to find out what is really going on. 
come and that makes you come from a place of humility instead of superiority or power, which is off-putting to your students. Uh, and then ends up having the opposite impact where you're not helping your student and you're not getting the result that you need. Uh, I think accountability needs to be a shared conversation. It, can't, it has to be a space of shared power. It's not just about a teacher or instructor saying, this is what needs to happen. You need to involve your students in that discussion because students of color come from, a, there's so much in their lives, almost said our lives, <laughs> in their lives where they don't have power or power is being taken away from them. This is a unique opportunity as an educator to provide those spaces where they have shared power uh, to be able to advance their academic success. Yeah, so um, follow up to that question. Um, I like how you were talking about accountability, but how do you balance accountability with flexibility? Yeah, that's a tricky question. I think that in order to do that, you you need to have a sense, a shared sense of what the end goal is and what's most important. Is it most important that your students get their work submitted by a certain day and time or that there's an end learned result that happens that you're able to see from the work they submitted or um, conversations they have with you. So figuring out what your end goal is for your student to be able to say, you know what, they've successfully learned something, they've gotten something, they've obtained something from this course. This is a bit easier to do in the college setting. So of course I'm speaking more from this space, uh, but how many uh, syllabus, there are several, you know, like I've had syllabi, syllabi yeah, syllabi that have uh, taken off points for lateness, uh, whether it's late to class or if a paper's a day late, uh, you know, like, are those things important? You know, or have you can have boundaries, your initial boundaries, and set the culture and the tone for respect and that relationship so that if a student is going to have a challenge with meeting that expectation, they know they can come to you because you're going to find a way to help them be successful and still be accountable. Um, so it's you still have the boundaries that you set, but then being able uh, to set the tone to be uh, flexible with your students. Uh, and you can't predict all situations because everybody's situation is different. So it really has to become a shared conversation where a student can share what their challenge is and you can ask them, what do I need to do to help you be successful? Uh, thank you. And Edgar, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, you know, I, I love this question around accountability and flexibility. And my first thought is um, Charlie Cooksey, um, who runs an organization out of St. Louis called We Power. I read a recent blog post of her of hers, and she reminds us that there can be no accountability um, if there is no relationship. And so, part of holding people accountable is to be in relationship with them, right? And so, just a, a food for thought there, um, and then. I often question whether like rules are rules and standards are standards, um, but I think it's important to question the purpose of rules. You know, is it about compliance mm -hmm. or is it about knowledge, gaining more knowledge? Like what, how are we structuring our systems? Because a, a syllabus is a system, right? There's, there's a standard structures, expectations, whatnot. And so are your systems and are your tools structured in a way that it's really just about compliance or is it really about expanding knowledge base, expanding wisdom, expanding opportunity? Um, and I think that we all have to make that individual determination. Clearly deadlines are important and there are things that are important in the world that we currently live in. Um, but is, is, is your intent to hold people compliant to something that really doesn't have make any sense? Yeah, and I just want to um, invite all the attendees to um, pop any questions in the Q and A. Um, I did want to highlight um, something that one of the attendees said. They said that uh, Elena Aguilar's Coaching for Equity book has some great processes for helping teachers see their actions and biases um, and more, and how these negatively affect students of color in their classroom. So that was just an addition to this question. Um, 
One of the last questions is going to be addressed um, to Dr. Carruthers and Dr. Martin. Um, in the past, the black and brown communities have worked separately, um, oftentimes competing with each other and sometimes even worse competing against each other um, in the desire for equity. Yet we know that we work stronger together. Are Hispanic and African-American communities coming together um, to collect collectively demand a course of action to meet the needs of both communities? And if not, how do we make it happen? I can't really imagine that the needs are much different. I don't think that we've done enough of this. And I think it has to take leadership starting at the district office level, leadership at the building level to make sure that those voices come together. The needs might be somewhat different, but as someone mentioned, the outcomes are the same. And so we need to put forward those types of efforts. Uh, you know, I've been reading a lot about culturally responsive leadership, and it, it includes bringing the community in, uh, asking the community what it is, what do you like, what do you want from us in terms of your children? How would you like for us to work with your children? Uh, what community knowledge can we value uh, that we can use uh, to uh, include in the curriculum? It might be speakers, it might be special talents of uh, parents and community members. I think that we, if we start doing that and doing it collectively across different groups that we will begin to, to think about how we can collaborate together. So again, it takes that leadership at all levels. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Dr. Carruthers. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a, a different lens on it and, and slightly different. Um, I think that, you know, when the system is designed for us to uh, fight over resources uh, mm -hmm. and infrastructure, um, I think that's, that's, that's problematic. I think in the campus ethos and in the campus mission, I think um, efforts related to black and brown needs to be embedded in that. I'm not sure um, why a lot of efforts, we say that we want efforts with uh, certain students or even you know, some of the efforts related to, to, to faculty. You know, why does that have to be a one-off type of situation? That should be a part of the campus ethos in what we do. Um, I think that's all in the spirit of higher education, or at least it should be. And so um, I think those are some of the things that we have to do with the understanding that it's important for us to be proactive, proactive instead of reactionary, you know, as we approach these things. And so, you know, I just want to give uh, credit to my administration, um, Dr. Agarwal and um, our provost, um, uh, Jenny Lundgren, uh, for being, you know, at the vanguard of all these different things. And um, I think, you know, UMKC is headed in an upward trajectory, but I think these conversations that we've had today are critical to sort of put everything on the table and figure out how we move forward. And, we, and to add to that, I think we have to listen to what children have to say about what they want from schools, their voices as Dr. Sanchez mentioning, mentioned in her conversation, listening to the voices of kids because they can tell us what they want. Uh, we interviewed 172 elementary and secondary kids about what they want from urban schools and they were able to tell us. And so if we listen more and give them a sense of empowerment, they can tell us what they need in order to be successful. Uh, we can, uh, improve or put in place uh, these academic identities that Dr. Martin talks about where we begin to value, uh, help kids value their academics and to uh, develop an academic identity. Thank you. And um, Edgar, do you have anything to add? You know, I think um, I, I am reminded every day that there are efforts um, amongst black and brown folks to tackle these issues um, in a collective and, and communal minded manner. Um, and so there are narratives out there that will say that we don't work together as communities and whatnot, but 
Um, I'm very fortunate to see these activities happen in classrooms and um, in school buildings and community. And so I, I, I think that that's something I, 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 I like to point out that it may not get a big splash sometimes, but it definitely does happen. And just a reminder to all of us, black, brown and otherwise, um, that white supremacy is the common enemy. And so if we can remember that and, and, and remind ourselves of that when we're doing this work and, and to remove ourselves of these limiting beliefs around resources and access and whatnot, um, I think that that's where the work becomes really interesting and powerful um, because we do have a common enemy, all of us, and, and that is white supremacy. So this next question is coming from um, the Q&A, moving back a little bit um, from the order. Some people um, asked some questions. Um, Dr. Martin, this will be addressed to you. Um, could you expand further on the NLM effects on college athletes? And they say, I agree that the problem exists, but I do not see the connection to athletes being exploited. And they say, meaning the current changes to how it's being handled. Are we talking about the name, image, and likeness? Is that what we're referring to? Um, I believe so. I just want to make sure I'm clear before I respond. Mm. Is that NLM? Is that what they wrote? It's, it's, it's NIL. Oh, NIL. There you go. Oh. So, it's, so it's NIL. Yeah, there you okay. go. Okay. So I think that's a great question. And so I think um, if we talk about the percentages of um, <laughs> African-American um, basketball players who um, are college, college basketball players, it, it's 58% uh, uh, that, that are black. And football, I believe, is hovering around 48%. We have a overrepresentation of uh, black and brown student athletes in revenue sports. Um, but we have an underrepresentation who are at positions like mine. Okay, that, that's a reality. Okay. And so when we talk about the name, image, and likeness, this is, this is all about these student athletes being able to, to profit. Okay. Um, this is not the institution paying the student athletes. This is about the student athletes being able to go out to corporate sponsors and to go out to other funders <clears throat> based off of their talents to be able to profit off of their name, image, and likeness. When we talk about the, the issue of exploitation, okay, there's a difference between exploitation and being underserved. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, I've, I've had to evolve beyond this issue of student athletes being underserved and there's points where I think they, they might be exploited. But if we do not provide opportunities, and this doesn't have anything to do with the, the universities and the athletic departments, this is mostly centered around the NC2A and how they want us to govern this and manage this for that, for, for a better word. If we do not provide opportunities for these um, student athletes to be able to maximize that, I think we're doing them a disservice. I think um, this is something that um, has been incorrigible for a number of different years and has been talked about and everybody has shied away against it. But here's, here's my thing. If you have, and I'm talking about the power five, if you have a quarterback who is throwing five touchdowns um, every weekend and athletic departments and universities able to profit from that. Why shouldn't that student athlete be able to do the same thing? Okay, now we don't have that issue at UMKC, but I'm speaking of just the industry and I'm speaking of the, the, the landscape. And so here's the thing, there's black and brown student athletes who offer um, so much to the intercollegiate athletic enterprise. And if we're not allowing space for them to profit off of that, um, that's, that's doing them a disservice. And it's a contradiction to what we do, not only in the athletic department, 
but higher education at large. And Dr. Martin, here's where I'll insert this little tidbit. Ed O'Bannon, who brought the uh, uh, antitrust class action suit against the NCAA, he's my cousin. <laughs> How about that? Great player, great player, by the way. Oh yeah, UCLA champions, right? That's right. All That's right, Adri Adriana, we got about three uh, questions from the uh, audience, so we'll tee those up. Go for it. All right, yeah. Um, the next one, sorry, give me one second. Um, the next question was, um, somebody said that they would like to know about student success in math, science, and engineering courses. Um, they said, some say that having a format of traditional lectures, working homework, and a few high stake exams can be a barrier to student success. Um, if any of the panelists would like to speak on this. Oh, Dr. Carruthers, uh, unmute. Dr. Carruthers, you'll have to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I won't blame it on my age. <laughs> I High know. stakes exams are a barrier for many, many kids, uh, science, math, et cetera, uh, because some kids do not do well on math. And if we are measuring their success using just tests, then we're going to miss a lot of kids. I think we have to have multiple assessments. We have to have multiple ways of looking at success. And again, uh, I think that whole notion of one size fits all is will just not do in terms of helping kids move into that area. Even when we assess gifted kids, we have to use uh, different measures that are not that that are not culturally biased. Uh, we may have to use uh, various uh, assessments in terms of that, and so it has to be a combination of ways to assess learning instead of just simply relying on test. Anyone else wanna weigh in? There's another question that says, I am also curious about students uh, building community with each other at a predominantly commuter campus such as UMKC. Is that particularly important for black and brown students? I assume so, but how can this be accomplished? So I, I'm a proud graduate of uh, UMKC. I graduated in um, 2008, I believe, from the Conservatory of Music. And I will tell you, um, I feel like I missed out on a lot. So I think after 2008, like, the campus itself has become more prone to like building relationships and building community. Um, Avanzando, um, Ivan Ramirez, who runs a phenomenal program, um, Avanzando, like that was in its beginnings. And so um, I think UMKC in itself has done phenomenal work um, in improving the narrative of it as a community, a community, sorry, not community college, but a commuter college to a, a really like a college that's centered in student life and building the, the, that opportunity, um, the soccer stadium. I mean, just like all the other amenities that exist at UMKC now that didn't before um, 2008 is, is impressive. And so um, I think that UMKC has listened well to its student population. I'm sure there's always more work to do, uh, but if I could go back again, I would. You know what? I want to double down on Edgar's comments. I graduated way back in 1985, and I'm flat out jealous of what these kids can now experience at UMKC because it is so different than when I graduated that I'm like you, Edgar. I would love to just transport, you know, back, you know, back forward and go. If I could experience what these kids now uh, can experience at UMKC, I. I got to tell you, I think my life would probably be different, you know, just because I think I would have more connections and more friends, you know, and more from my college years. I want to double down on UMKC too. They have done a phenomenal job of investing in that campus. And I'm even going to say thank you for all the parking structures you now have, because I had to park along Troost when it was four degrees below zero and walk to my classes. And now you have all these building structures that make it so easy. So I want to double down. But I also want to get Adriana in here because, hey, we've got a sophomore student here at UMKC. What do you think about that question? We're interested in your thoughts. I think we all are. 
Yeah, I actually particularly like this question because um, I entered UMKC fall 2019 as a freshman and I actually lived on campus. I lived in the dorms for my first year of college. Um, and I had a lot of friends who I went to high school with who also like were freshmen with me at the same time who were commuters. So um, I was able to like share my experience with them and they like shared their experience with me and like we kind of compared and I think like definitely um, being on campus um, is very different um, and living here because everything is so accessible and um, like Edgar said that once on the program I'm a part of that I'm a part of the PAL program and I think it's because when you're on campus you seek that support and you're going places and you're like sharing that um, I think that's important being like a Latina on campus um, both like being a part of um, Latinx culture and then like also as a woman of color um, just because I think personally like we need more support and like the resources that are there um, I was able to seek them out versus like somebody who's a commuter like they come for class and then they don't really stay on campus that long and I think that's something important for them I always encourage my friends um, you know, stay on campus, like come here. I think the experience has definitely changed with the pandemic. Um, I think a lot of people are afraid to come to campus and even like through the PAL program, I have like scholars who are international students who haven't had the opportunity to come to campus at all. And they don't really know where the resources are. So I think that that's even like a barrier that all students of color have on campus. Yeah, and explain what the PAL program is real quick, Adrian. Yeah, so um, UMKC's PAL program, um, PAL stands for a peer academic leader. Um, so the peer academic leadership program, we assist freshmen on campus. Um, we're, we connect with the first semester experience um, coursework. So we assist all freshmen um, and we do programming. We mostly meet individually to um, identify the needs of students and um, you know, build on their goals and assist them academically, providing them resources that they wouldn't be um, get access to otherwise or know that existed. That was great. All right, so I'm going to do one more call out for Q and A from the uh, participants still on with us, um, and this is our final wrap up question. So, how can a white person support black and brown people in both easy and difficult situations? And how does a white provider advocate for the underserved in areas like education, healthcare, et cetera? And this was a question from the audience. Who wants to tackle that one? I'll jump right in. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Dr. Martin, I saw you on mute as well, so. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think a, a simple, simple request is uh, speaking up. Um, I think we've all been in situations, I assume most of us have been in situations where we know somebody said something that didn't feel quite right. Um, and then we all kind of look around the room and then typically a person of color has to step up and address the situation. Um, that's a great opportunity for allies and accomplices to step in and, and make, the, make the uncomfortable statement, you know, that something went awry. And so speaking up is so powerful um, taking the pressure of, of people uh, off of people of color to always consistently acknowledge like racism and all these other things. If you can acknowledge it as well, um, that is so helpful in, in, in this context. And so it relieves the pressure. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel seen. Um, it, it also builds trust. Um, and so if we don't constantly have to tackle these issues by ourselves and we don't constantly have to speak up on them by ourselves, um, that's a great way to, to, to support. And I think also knowing the community and the resources are out there. So when students reach out for help or wh whomever it might be, that you have some sense of what's out there in the community. So that's why it's really important for schools to partner with the community so that they are aware of those resources that students might need, that teachers might need. Many times teachers need mental health kinds of issues. I mean, in terms of teaching, no matter where you are, it's oftentimes a very stressful kind of a situation. 
So teachers also need care. Uh, if we're looking at culturally responsive uh, uh, pedagogy, we need to find teachers who are masters at that and then allow them to mentor other teachers as well and bring them along. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add off of um, what Dr. Brothers and um, Edgar pointed out. I think it goes back to some of the things that we've kind of covered um, in this critical conversation. One is the importance of uh, relationships and being authentic with that effort. I think that's that's critically important um, in, in relation to that question. The other one is 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 to hot, have high expectations for students, um, and, and we we talk about that. Um, and so, um, but I think this is this is the one that I think is most important. I think as we talk about the the, the white teachers and 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 those the white advocates that we have for black and brown students, it's important that in the times where there's there's some sort of conversation about black and brown that they speak up with their other white peers and colleagues. It's critically important, critically important because it cannot be just a one-off conversation to say, okay, Laura, okay, Edgar, we're on board, Dr. we're on board with this, but they don't have enough courage to go to their white peers and colleagues. It, mm -hmm. It, it's it's not gonna work. So that would just be my. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Miss Sanchez wanted to add into the previous question um, about building communities um, and students of color. Um, Miss Sanchez. Actually, it was it was for this question. Um, but just to say, you know, if you're a white person and you're in a in a space and uh, kind of similar to what Edgar was saying, if if you hear something, if it feels wrong, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, if it feels uncomfortable to say something, that's the time to say something. Um, because if it's uncomfortable for you, think about what the person of color in that space or not in that space would feel if they heard it. Um, because it, it's more than uncomfortable for them. Uh, so it, it becomes it, being an ally uh, in terms of listening, in terms of doing the research, doing the reading, uh, knowing the history, but then also, you know, in those day-to-day -day spaces, just like calling stuff out, even if it's, you don't know what to say, you can say, hey, this doesn't feel right to me. I feel mm -hmm. like something is wrong with this. That's enough of a disruption to be an effective ally, um, but don't let the discomfort stop you from being an ally. If mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable, it means that something needs to happen. That's that's an excellent response because you're absolutely right. Because sometimes we shut others down through pointing fingers and blaming, but that whole notion of talking first about what this feels like for me opens up that conversation. All right, Dr. Carruthers, we're gonna let you take us home with some final words, just because I know you got them. And um, I want to uh, acknowledge this panel. This, 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 this panel is multi-talented and and because they've been answering all of the questions in the Q&A as they've been speaking. So not everybody can do that. So uh, congratulations and my tip of the hat to you. Dr. Carruthers, any final words that you want to uh, uh, send the uh, audience uh, out with? Well, I know that there are powerful leaders out there, and I just want to say that all of this takes culturally responsive school leadership at every level of the system, central offices uh, and the staff to value these black and brown children. Uh, we must all work together to support culturally responsive and equitable schooling, promoting a culturally responsive vision of a school. Uh, it's important to look at data, uh, disaggregate that data by race, gender, language, and et cetera, uh, in terms of establishing equity teams as learning groups of practice so that you know where our kids are uh, in terms of their learning. 
Uh, again, we've talked about this whole notion of fostering academic uh, expectations or ac an academic identity and high expectations, because we know that there's quite a bit of literature out there in these both of these areas, and this will make a lot of difference in terms of not just what we call achievement in terms of testing, but learning. So how do we take kids that are below grade level, two or three years behind, and then out of 10 months of instruction, begin to bring those kids up so that they have exceeded um, that level at where they were at the beginning of the year. And so that takes much more of a focus on learning. Uh, rejecting this whole notion of low expectations and beginning to think about our attitudes and our belief systems. How do we promote and, uh, deficit thinking? How do we think about who we are? It's, it's sort of like having inner conversations with self. What do I see about race, class, gender, and language in my speech? What do I not see? And why do I see it this way? What about me? and my belief systems that causes me to see it in this manner. This whole notion of being a warm demander and caring for students and their communities, uh, using that communities to influence our teaching practices, encouraging curricular initiatives that are culturally relevant and incorporate that community-based knowledge. A lot of focus is on kids now is this whole notion of hip hop and spoken word and we know that those issues, uh, spoken word is about 40 years of age, but a lot of what students do today will be focused on some of this community knowledge where spoken word, hip hop, and those areas are value. Bringing some of those things to bear on our instruction and using it to extend uh, knowledge and learning. Uh, again, identifying teachers who are culturally relevant. I think we don't focus enough on teachers that are doing the work that needs to be done. Teachers who are using communi community-based knowledge and use those teachers to mentor other teachers. We have to have conversations about race and marginal marginalized community through open dialogue and sharing. And sometimes this takes courage, and then we have to provide culturally responsive training and professional development. Now, these are just some of the things I do believe that needs to happen to make uh, schools really matter for uh, all kids. And so uh, I'm just gonna leave it at that. I mean, I don't think it's a magic bullet. I don't think that it takes so much that we have to do this, we have to do that, but I think we have to think about where we are in terms of districts and schools and begin to think about what kinds of work do we need to do and how do we collaborate with community. Well, you have certainly left us a lot, Dr. Carruthers. Thank you so much. We're going to leave it there to the panel. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge this afternoon. In addition, I want to thank you for all you do. You're truly all community champions and we're fortunate to have you all here. On behalf of UMKC Chancellor Molly Agrawal, Interim Vice Chancellor of the Division of Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Makina King, Lona Davenport, Yvonne Hood, my co-moderator, Adriana Suarez. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. In the meantime, please stay well and most importantly, stay safe.